Hey there, friend. Heather Creekmore here. Glad you're listening to the Compared to You show today. Today may be one of the most important shows we do because as Christian women specifically, I know there may be some guys listening to, I think we've gotten it wrong on gluttony. I think the church has been too heavily influenced by the voices of diet culture, which is really kind of rooted in idolatry and body idolatry. But I think we have just subconsciously let these messages seep into our congregations and we're getting it wrong on gluttony. And I talked to so many women whom a dietitian would say isn't eating enough that are worried that they are gluttons. Friends, that is not what it's about at all. And that's where we're going today. I'm so glad you're here for it. I really hope you'll share this episode with someone else in your life who maybe needs to hear this. Maybe this will be life-changing for you, and maybe this will be life-changing for them. Because the enemy has held us in guilt and shame and condemnation around gluttony according to a standard that is not the Bible standard at all. So I'm glad you're here for it. Hey, today's show and really shows all this season have been sponsored by Classical Conversations. If you're looking to give your child a well-rounded education while also ensuring positive socialization opportunities and their ability to succeed in life, then consider joining a Classical Conversations community and homeschooling right alongside local families. These communities are led by a trained licensed director and families learn through Classical Conversations proven Christ-centered curriculum together in a community. There's locations in all 50 50 states, over 50 countries, there's bound to be a community near you. So to find your community today, visit classicalconversations.com backslash compare to who. That's classicalconversations.com backslash compare to who. Now let's get to today's show. Welcome to Compare to Who, the podcast to help you make peace with your body so you can savor God's rest and feel his love. If you're tired of fighting body image the world's way, Compare to Who is the show for you. You've likely heard lots of talk about loving your body, but my goal is different. Striving to fall in love with stretch marks and cellulite is a little silly to me. Instead, I want to encourage you and remind you with the truth of scripture that you are seen, you are known, and you are loved no matter what your size or shape. Here, the pressure is off. If you're looking for real talk, biblical encouragement, and regular reminders that God loves you and you're not alone, you've come to the right place. I hope you enjoy today's show and hey, tell a friend about it. Hey there, friend. I've got to admit to you, I'm nervous about this one. This is such a hot button issue for so many And there's so much out there, some of it by men of God that I truly respect and admire. And so it feels really risky to me to even challenge some of these thoughts, but I think we need to. And here is my encouragement and exhortation to you. We get at your Bible while you're listening is great, but if you're listening while you drive, that might not be convenient. So grab your Bible later. My goal is not to convince you to think like I think or believe like I believe, but I do want to present some thoughts to challenge some of these things that I think we're just getting wrong, but you get to decide at the end of the day, (laughs) you get to decide what you're going to believe. And I think that is the beautiful thing about having a relationship with Jesus Christ, having the Holy Spirit indwell you. You can ask for help to not only understand these things, we can ask the Holy Spirit for clarity and for wisdom. And we can even, it's not super fun, but we can say, hey, convict me. If gluttony is where I am going astray, convict me, please. I do not want any sin to stand in the way of my relationship with Jesus Christ. But friends, I think our thoughts and feelings around gluttony are based more in shame that comes from the diet culture that we live in and that our churches exist in and that our pastors exist in than it does from the actual word of God. So that's where we're going. 
Now, I don't even really know where to start. I have tried to record this episode a couple times, starting from different places, honestly, because I'm like, ah, there's so much. So we're just going to start with a history. Now, I'm getting a lot of what I'm throwing at you today from an article, and I will link it in the show notes, an article called, But What About Gluttony? It's by Kevin DeYoung. He's a pastor. I have had read some of his other things. So I have some experience with what he believes where he's coming from. And I think he's solid. So when I found this blog post on the Gospel Coalition site, um, I was really interested (laughs) in what he had to say. Now, full disclosure, the DeYoung article is actually kind of a response piece to a different issue. And it's the issue of homosexuality and how a lot of times you'll hear this argument that like, why are Christians worried about that? Because really, shouldn't we be worried about gluttony and kind of a tit for tat on that issue is really where he's coming from. So if you click the link, you might be confused at first. But if you get deep into what he is presenting, oh, you'll find some good stuff. So this is straight from Jiang's article. I'm going to read it to you straight from there. It says, gluttony is a favorite vice to throw into the rhetorical mix because it is one of the so-called seven deadly sins. As Will Willimon explains, the earliest formation of the list of seven comes from Evagrius of Pontus, a desert monk and follower of Origen, who was later condemned at the Fifth Ecumenical Council in AD 553. He goes on to say, it's not surprising that an ascetic who lived in a commune separated from the world might consider the temptation for food one of his chief maladies. One can detect more than a little monkish asceticism and some stoic disdain for the body in the father's abhorrence to gluttony. Okay, what what does that mean in common English? So basically, I read this and then I went and I did more research on this Evagrius of Pontus guy. And so I said he was later condemned. Essentially, he was ruled a heretic and a mystic by, um, let's just say, the credible <laughs> Christian leaders of the day in AD 553. Okay, so, so just with that as your starting point, understand that the person who first connected gluttony to eating too much food was ruled a heretic and a mystic, okay? So just just that's a little background. It wasn't Jesus. It was Evagrius of Pontus. Now, the other thing that DeYoung is saying here, just kind of put it in common English, is that he's a monk. So like, what could he go overboard with, right? He's not, it's not materialism, right? Monks don't have anything. Monks live, what, in solitude with other monks in a monastery, there is not a whole lot of sins available to this guy in terms of things he could actually do, right? Sin is always in our heart. So lots of sins he could commit there. But this is the guy who connected gluttony to overeating. Now, the other thing, the last sentence I read to you there, one can detect more than a little monkish asceticism and some stoic disdain for the body in the father's abhorrence to gluttony. The thing that de Young is saying here, and it kind of it ties into Gnosticism, right? Where Gnostics separated the body from like everything on the inside, your emotions, your spirit, your soul, like all those things were separate from the body. And this monk hated his body. I don't mean that he had body image issues. Instead, what I mean is that he hated the desires and the needs of his body. He felt shame that his body had needs and urges like the need to eat, and he was trying to control it. Maybe you can relate. I know I can. But that's not good theology. That ties in to this disdain, this abhorrence, as as de Young says, this hatred, this, um, I don't know, I, I would say it's almost a fear, right, of letting the body get out of control because you eat too much food. And in that is, I'm going to say not <laughs> the way the Bible treats and talks about the body, right? The Bible doesn't talk and treat the body as if it is something we should disdain. Like our body is us and we are our bodies, right? Our body is not to be praised. Our body is not to be like in terms of being put on a pedestal and like body more important than everything else, right? But you can't 
do anything (laughs) without your body. You can't live on this earth without your body, right? You are made in the image of God. God made us on purpose for a purpose in a body. And so any theology that detests the body or disdains the body or doesn't appreciate the body or, you know, really treats the body as something bad or evil or icky is not good theology. And we're going to dig more into this right after this quick break. And he created our bodies to run on food on purpose. Now, I don't know about you, it's sometimes hard for me to figure out exactly how much food I need, right? Like there's really no way to be perfect in terms of eating just the right amount of food. I think this is one of the struggles really around intuitive eating is that we kind of go into intuitive eating thinking like, okay, well, if I am just intuitively eating, if I'm listening to my body all the time, then my body will always get it right. My body will always say, stop eating now. Beep, beep, beep. Alert, alert. Stop eating. And then I'll listen to my body perfectly and then I'll be the size I want to be. And that's not what intuitive what eating is all about, but it's also important to notice that like our body is not going to be able to do that perfectly all the time. There are going to be times when you are going to be in a rush. You're going to be in a hurry. Maybe it's been an emotionally charged day, busy day. You're tired. You're hungry. You eat and you might not know that you've eaten more than you wanted to or should have, quote unquote, should have until 30 minutes after the meal because you feel, ugh, I ate too much, right? Is that a sin? Is that really like what we're going to say the sin of gluttony is? Is eating too much, responding to a physiological desire to eat that God gave us and saying, oh, I ate too much. Now I'm a glutton. Now I'm a sinner. Like if to me, it sounds like when, when we make that connection, it sounds like God has set me up for failure around food. Because how in the world am I supposed to know the exact perfect amount of food to eat every time? Like most of us probably, and, and you know, I talk to y'all all the time. And I know some of you feel so weighed down with shame over gluttony a lot. And especially my friends, if you've been a restrictor, if you've been a dieter, if you've been on all the plans over all the years, listening to your body is going to be really difficult. Your body signals are going to be really confusing because you've turned your body off. At least I did. I said, no, I don't want to listen to that hunger. You know, I'm a, I'm a champion. If I can go to bed hungry, (laughs) like ignoring my hunger makes me powerful and great. Like that, those are kind of the mantras of diet plans that I had followed. And, And so I turned my body off, making it even more difficult for me to know when I was eating enough or when I was overeating. So if this is what gluttony is, It just seems wrong (laughs) that God set us up for something so hard. And I really don't believe that's the truth. I really think God is a good God. He's a good father. I use this line in my book that comes out in December. Like God has numbered the hairs on our head. But I don't think he's counting the macros on your plate. I think he loves you (laughs) and he gives you so much grace for your relationship with food to be as messy as it is because you have lived in a culture, in a world that has made our relationships with food so super messy. Okay, but again, don't listen to me. Let's go to the Bible. So DeYoung talks about how through church history, theologians have understood gluttony and the sin of gluttony because it is a sin in different ways and he talks about how for some it's like this immoderate desire that is the problem like if you just you want all the things you want too much you want 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 but for others it's eating more than we need so there are theologians that adhere to this but DeYoung talks about how Augustine whom I, I love Augustine stuff Augustine of Hippo Augustine said that food was not the problem The problem is how we sought it and for what reason. So could your comfort eating 
be gluttony. That's, I think, what everyone's worried about, right? Maybe, but I'm not (laughs) going to say definitely like some do. I just don't think that's biblical because again, physiologically, we were made to eat. And I love how my friend Erin Davis, she did a series on her podcast um, on feasting and fasting. And she talks about the story of how after Jesus um, was resurrected and he meets his disciples for the first time on the beach, what does he do for them? He cooks them breakfast. Like what an emotional time. These disciples have been following Jesus for three years. They think he's gone. They think he's dead. They think it's over. Like they're probably fearing for their lives. If anyone would figure out their association and Jesus comes and he cooks for them. Like food is something that helps our bodies in times of great emotion, right? Like, why do we all bring casseroles to someone's house when they have a death in the family, right? Food is part of the way we grieve, right? And grief is just one of many emotions that we experience, right? God made our bodies. He knows the wide variety of emotions that we feel, not just internally, in our bodies. And food can help sometimes. So I cannot tell you that you are being gluttonous if you have had a super stressful, hard, just taxing day and you go back for a second bowl of ice cream. I'm not in a position to tell you that is what gluttony is. And that's why I want you talking to the Lord about this stuff, friend. I don't want to sound cliche, but you've got to be talking to the Holy Spirit. I noticed that when I took my rules, my diet culture rules around food off the table and started just really digging into, okay, what is the truth? Like what is okay with food? Like I noticed the Holy Spirit was willing to convict me (laughs) when willing, that's probably a silly word, but he was faithful is probably the better way to say it, to convict me when I was going overboard. And there were times when I had to make that decision. Okay. There were times when I had the bowl of ice cream and it was like, I want more and I'm going back for the second bowl. And I heard the Holy Spirit's conviction, not audibly, but you don't need that, Heather. I'm, I'm here for you. It's okay. And there were times when I was like, nope, I need it. I need to do it. And I'll tell you, this is a little little bit of a divergence here. But understanding how easy it was for me to do that, how easy it was for me to ignore him in the face of temptation and go get more. And I hate to use the word temptation there because I, I, uh, I think associating food with temptation is way out of whack, right? But but being tempted, let me say it this way, being tempted to do something that I felt the Holy Spirit had clearly told me not to do. In the face of that temptation, I was willing to say, nope, I'm going to do it anyway. And that is sin. But acknowledging my own <laughs> ability to do that really helped me empathize with others who struggle with other sins, where in my mind, I'd be like, come on, like, just say no to the temptation. Like, it's bad for you. Just say no. Like, don't do that thing. Like, get over that addiction. You know, stop doing that thing that's harmful to you or to your family. Just get over it. And when I realized, oh, wait, Holy Spirit can convict and we have the choice to say, no, I'm going to do it anyway. Like it gave me more empathy for others who are struggling with different things. Okay. Was it gluttony? Is that the sin I was guilty of when I went back for that second bowl of ice cream? I still don't even know that that's true, right? I think the sin I may be guilty of when I go back for the second bowl of ice cream is more likely not listening (laughs) to the Holy Spirit, right? Like not obeying. That's the sin that I probably need to be more concerned about rather than eating too much ice cream. Now, I want to bring in C.S. Lewis here. I'm a big C.S. Lewis fan. I don't know if you are, but... You need to read Screw Tape Letters. Now, Screw Tape Letters is, if you're not familiar with it, it's really, it's kind of hard to understand because it's like this demon that's writing to his 
uh, another demon is his uncle and um, they're talking about like this man and like his life following Christ. He becomes a Christian. And, and so like the demon is advising the other demon on like really how to take him down. But there's a lot of gold <laughs> in this book. And one piece of gold that you may have never noticed, I didn't until very recently, is that C.S. Lewis talks about a different kind of gluttony. He talks about a gluttony called the gluttony of delicacy. And he he characterizes this by, and this is how De Young says, persnickety old ladies, the kind who always turn aside whatever is offered and insist on a tiny cup of tea. And Lewis says they're just as guilty of gluttony because they put their wants first, no matter how troublesome they may be to others. Oh, my friends who are gluten free and don't have celiac or any other diagnosis <laughs> or like, oh, oh, friends, there's there's so many different ways that I felt convicted when I read this of all the times that it was like, I'm gluten free. Like, I can't believe you didn't accommodate me, you know, and I never would have said that out loud again. OK, hear me. But this is what's going on in my heart. You know, like we, I, rem- I remember had surgery and I had my tonsils out and this was like seven or eight years ago and I just remember we had people bring us meals and I was gluten-free and I thought that people knew that but not all of them did and so people were bringing us meals filled with gluten and it was just like oh I can't eat it and I remember and I was heavily medicated so maybe I should just blame the medication I just remember kind of throwing a fit my husband crying like I just want something to eat and I can't believe these people don't know that I'm gluten free and it's ridiculous right but Lewis says that's gluttony (laughs) thinking of ourselves ahead of others being the like oh I can't eat that because I'm not like eating this now and eating this now and eating like oh my goodness friends like how many of us have done that I'm raising my hand like I'm at the front of the line so feel no shame or condemnation coming from this girl because I'm leading the parade of people who have turned down food because of dietary restrictions that were really just about being thin not about anything medical okay hear me if you've got an allergy, like you got something medical going on, I am not shaming you in any way. I'm just saying I want to be skinny, so I'm not eating these things. And C.S. Lewis says that could be gluttony. Let's let's like really if to, we broaden our definition of gluttony to include that. Like, doesn't that kind of blow your mind a little bit? It blows mine. De Young says. Gluttony is using food in a way that dulls us from the spiritual and distracts us from God. And he says that's certainly a danger for most of us, but it's not the same as enjoying a meal, feeling stuffed, or being overweight. Those are not what gluttony is. Okay, so let's dig into scripture. Um, You can grab a Bible if you have one. Uh, so he says this, this is all from him. I want to make sure that I attribute credit to where credit is due because he's done this research. So he talks about first, he, he sets the stage. He says, the Bible is overwhelmingly positive about food. <laughs> there are Old Testament feasts and visions of heavenly feasts. And let me just kind of add to this a little bit, right? Remember, we're going to have heavenly bodies someday and we won't need to eat. And yet God is going to throw us a feast like I don't know, according to our kind of small definition of gluttony down here, I would say if you don't need to eat and you eat, we would consider that gluttony a lot of times in the American church. And here, that's what's going to happen when we get to heaven. We're not going to need to eat and we're going to eat. Like, is anyone else's, if your mind is blown, just drop me an email. Okay, Heather, I compare to you to me because I want to know. It blew my mind to think about that. I'm just going to read to you what else Deyoung says here. He says, if the New Testament has an overriding concern with food, it is that God's people not be overly concerned about it. What? Wait, wait, wait. It's that God's people not be overly concerned about it. Oh, my friend, how many of us are stressing about food all day, every day? I was like, um, my friend, I understand you <laughs> if that's where you're at. And what God's more worried about is that we're overly concerned about food rather than eating too much of it. Like, oh, does that blow your paradigm? Blows mine. So he talks, here's some scriptures to look up. He says, food does not commend us to God. That's 1 Corinthians 8, 8. 
The kingdom of God does not consist of food and drink, Romans 14, 17. And then he says, no honest reader of the New Testament can deny that Jesus and the apostles were much more concerned about what we do sexually with our bodies than with the food we eat. And the references he uses here are Mark 7, 21 to 23, 1 Corinthians 6, 12 to 20, and 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. Now, get this, this part blew my mind. Okay, in the English Standard Version of the Bible, the word glutton appears, how many times do you think it is? Just put a guess out there in your head. Got your guess? ESV, the word glutton appears four times. Was that lower than your guess, higher than your guess? And in every instance, the word glutton is paired with the word drunkard. And here's the references on this, Deuteronomy 21, 20, Proverbs 23, 21. And then it's used in a slander against Jesus. Remember, Jesus was called a glutton, Matthew eleven nineteen, 19, and Luke 7, 34. The word gluttonous shows up once again alongside reference to drunkards in Proverbs 23, 20. Two other times we have gluttons, once in a quotation from a poet, speaking of the lazy Cretans, and it's in Titus 1, 12, and the other time in reference to the company of a shameful, the company that a shameful son keeps, and that's Proverbs 28, 7. Okay, I'm going to attach this article, so all the verse references are in there for you to look at. But friends, I don't know how, how many words, four times? <laughs> I mean, and it's always with drunkard. Like, does that change the way you have thought about gluttony at all? Right? If it's with the word drunkard, you're gluttonous and you're, you're a drunkard. If those are kind of lumped in together, what does gluttony really mean? I think it means something so much more than eating too much at Thanksgiving dinner. That's not it at all. It's really about self-indulgence really hedonism, like just doing whatever pleasures you without regard to anything else. Now, here's the one that um, I, we, I've heard so many people fat shamed for this verse, and it makes me so sad. So get out your Bible and go to Proverbs 23. Now, as I was researching for my book that comes out in December, I just was like Christian perspective on gluttony or what is gluttony? Like I just Googled a couple of things like that. And I found this article and it was, uh, I don't know, decades old, but it was a Billy Graham. Like I read it and I was kind of angry and I was like, oh my word, Billy Graham wrote that? And then I was really like frustrated and kind of discombobulated. And it was, a res it was actually a letter, like a letter to Billy Graham or a letter, you know, kind of like a letter to the editor column, but it was like, ask your faith questions or something like that. And it was from a newspaper. And this man was writing in like with his concern over his mom, who he thought ate too much. And he was worried about her having health problems because she eats too much. And, and so he's basically asking Billy Graham, like, what should I do about my mom that eats too much? And Billy Graham wrote him back this letter um, really referencing Proverbs 23. And the famous verse is Proverbs 23 two, And I'll just read you this little snippet out of context, and I'm going to put it all together for you. And put a knife to your throat if you're given to gluttony. Okay. And in fact, I saw an Instagram post the other day, and it made me so frustrated. <laughs> and it was the same kind of thing, like put a knife to your throat if you're given to gluttony. And the person who did it was like, see, you're supposed to put a knife to your throat if you're given to gluttony, not like put a knife to your stomach and get bariatric surgery or just, it was just ridiculous out of context. <laughs> and I'm not one to argue with people on social media, but I did have to say something on this one. Um, but so this passage, I, I want you to hear the whole passage. And I want you to get out your Bible and look it up. But Proverbs 23 is not about eating too much food. And I'll show you why in just a second. Okay, here's how it goes. When you sit to dine with a ruler, note well what is before you and put a knife to your throat if you're given to gluttony. Do not crave his delicacies for that food is deceptive. Do not wear yourself out to get rich. Do not trust your own cleverness. Cast but a glance at riches and they are gone, for they will surely sprout rings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. Do not eat the food of a begrudging host. Do not crave his delicacies, for he is the kind of person who is always thinking about the cost. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. And then listen to this. You will vomit up the little you have eaten and will have wasted your compliments. 
Okay, so put a knife to your throat if you're given to gluttony. And then later it says you'll vomit up the little you have eaten. Like this passage is not about how much you're eating. This passage is really about a lust for wealth, maybe even a lust for power. But lusting after wealth, wanting to be rich, wanting all that comes with being rich. And do not crave his delicacies for that food is deceptive. It's not about the actual food that's on the plate. It's, it's the food of, of wealth and materialism. Friends, as I was thinking about this today, I was thinking, you know what? I think I've been more gluttonous with clothing than I ever have been with food because I think any gluttony, if you know, anything I would have classified as gluttony, let me put it that way, around food that I would have thought, oh, that was gluttonous behavior around food. I think now that was physiological <laughs> because of my restriction. But when it comes to clothing, oh goodness, do I recognize that I have too many clothes? Absolutely. And yet, do I go buy more? Yeah, I keep doing it like that is gluttony. I'm feeding the beast. And do I think, wouldn't it be nice to have more money, to have more things? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I think that. And that, my friend, (laughs) is craving his delicacies. That is the food that is deceptive. That is what I need to repent of. Be like, no, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Right? This is not about food. And then again, verse six, do not eat the food of a begrudging host. Do not crave his delicacies. For he's the kind of person who's always thinking about the cost. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. You'll vomit up the little you've eaten and will have wasted your compliments. Like, uh, it's, it's really just about how we relate to each other right like how how do we love each other through our relationship our interactions around food right are we inviting people over for dinner and counting like oh they just ate five dollars worth of chicken and oh they ate that expensive cheesecake I thought we'd only eat half of it and I well, like whatever the thing is right I, I've done it right like oh I don't really want to feed them I'll, I'll buy the regular chicken instead of the organic because we're having company oh embarrassed have done it <laughs> right like like that's what it's about how do we relate to food in the company of others so I think to just use that little scripture out of context of the whole proverb there is really not biblically accurate. Um, There's another one, and this one you've probably heard too. It's Philippians 3.19. In fact, I've even coached some of you, but like, but Heather, Philippians 3.19. And that says, their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Now, who is the they, right? So if you read 319, you got to go back and read what is before it. So let me go back and read for you the verses before 319. Let's go back to 317. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model Keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I've often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. My friend, this is about enemies of the cross of Christ. If you are a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, you are not an enemy of the cross of Christ. Philippians 3.19 is not an admonition for followers of Jesus. It is not a litmus test as to whether or not you are a follower of Jesus. It is a description. Paul, like when you write, you, he's explaining who are these people that are enemies of the cross of Christ. These are people whose destiny is destruction. Their God is their bellies, is what many translations said and their glory is in their shame, their mind is set on earthly things, right? In fact, DeYoung says that this is probably a euphemism for their sexual sin, or it's a reference to the Judaizers' legalistic demands regarding mosaic dietary restrictions. Now, because 
I'm trying to tread so delicately here. We need to answer the question, right? What does the sin of gluttony look like? And I just want to read you DeYoung's definition because I really don't think I can do better than he did. Okay, so here's how he answers that question. When we take time to open our Bibles and read the relevant passages, we find that gluttony is so much more than eating a McRib sandwich and that partaking in food is much less of a concern than partaking in sexual sin. The composite picture from these verses suggests that a glutton is a loafer, a partier, and a profligate. He's the prodigal son wasting his life on riotous living. She's the girl on spring break who thinks the pinnacle of human existence is to eat, drink, and hook up. A wastrel living for the weekend. A big city high flyer who cares for nothing except indulging in high society. A ne'er-do-well who takes lifestyle cues from the hangover movies. So absolutely, the church should speak against the sin of gluttony. But once we understand what the sin entails, I'm guessing most people would say they have a good idea where the church already stands on these issues. That's, that's the end of his article. Friend, if you feel like you're eating too much because you're eating more than you ate on your restrictive diet, that is not gluttony. If you're trying to do intuitive eating and it feels really uncomfortable because your body keeps telling you you're hungry and you're eating more than you used to eat, that is not gluttony. If you are with a group of friends and celebrating and eating, maybe it's birthday party or you know, you're celebrating a family event and you're eating and you don't realize that you're super full <laughs> until 30 minutes after the meal, that is not gluttony. If you weigh more than you weighed in high school, if you weigh more than you weighed in your 30s or 40s, if you weigh more than you want to weigh, that does not mean you are a glutton. Friend, we've gotten it wrong on gluttony. Gluttony, just like so many other, dare I say all the sins in the Bible, is about your heart, not about what's on your plate, and not about what your body looks like. Is food the way you are sensually enjoying life and that's what you live for and you live to party and you live for, I mean, I guess you could be like a foodie to the extreme where like it is your idol, but like we talked about in the last show, I don't think food is an idol for most of us and I don't think gluttony is the hang up. Just one final thought for today. And this comes from Instagram, but it's a post by Leslie Schilling. She is an RD and an author who has a new book coming out on diet culture and eating and a healthy relationship with food. It's called Feed Yourself. And I'm really looking forward to this book and I'm looking forward to getting to know Leslie better as well. I'm hoping to invite her on the show, but let me read to you what this post says. You can follow her on Instagram and see this for yourself. Leslie Schilling, S-C-H-I. L-L-I-N-G is her name. It says, gluttony is a heart problem, not a what you eat or how you eat problem. And here's the caption. In my 20 plus years in practice, so as an RD, I have never met a glutton, but I've met countless people who've been harmed by misinterpreted teachings. We've caused so much hurt and shame around this word because we think the example of using or eating too much food is the definition of the word. It's wrong. Gluttony is a misaligned heart posture that leads to taking from others, not the food on your plate, not your willpower over the plate. We must stop these shaming teachings. Feeding yourself, even the times when it feels like a lot, isn't gluttony. In our restrictive culture, it makes sense that we feel that way. It's time to wipe diet culture from our lens. And I just thought that was so good. Just a great final reminder. Friend, what if the truth is God's not mad at you about the way you're eating? What if he actually wants you to enjoy food What if he actually invites you to come to the table and eat? What if he's not like that parent that watched everything on your plate? If he's not got cameras on you every time you go into the kitchen, like, oh, what's she going to choose? Is she going to be gluttonous? 
That is not our God. And I'm sorry if that's the example that was set forth for you by a relative or parent. But friend, that is not what God wants in your relationship with food. I think, frankly, he he wants you just to be free to think about other things and serve him and live life and enjoy this life you've been given with the people you have and the opportunities you have. And friend, there's just so much more to life rather than stressing over food and body all the time. I'm glad you listened today. I hope you are too. Hey, let me know your thoughts on this episode, Heather at ComparedToWho.me. And hey, leave a review. If this touched you, I would love to see um, more reviews to help other people find the show. Well, thanks for listening. I hope something today has helped you stop comparing and start living. The Compared To Show is a part of the Life Audio network of podcasts. Check out lifeaudio.com for more great content. 